Today's episode of Rates and Barrels is brought to you by the SoFi Daily Podcast. Did you know 37% of Americans would struggle to cover an unexpected $400 expense? April is National Financial Literacy Month, which means it's time to expand your financial knowledge. And that all starts with having the right information. For facts, analysis, and updates related to markets and financial awareness, listen to the SoFi Daily Podcast every weekday. Search for SoFi wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Friday, April 2nd, one day of the 2021 season in the books, and it was an eventful one. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris on this Friday, reacting to everything we saw and, and telling you overreacting. Calm down. Yeah, like, <laughs> we're going to try and calm you down in many cases. Maybe we'll fire you up in a few cases, but we're here to help just ease the tension going into the weekend. We don't want you to dump all your players and pick everybody up off the waiver wire. We want you to make the right moves, the right decisions. So we're going to fly around. We're going to do this a little bit different. We're going to go game by game, talk about some things that were interesting, some things that you should not overreact to. And hopefully it's going to be a lot of fun along the way. It was great seeing fans back in the stands because empty stadiums are weird. And even quarter capacity stadiums look a lot more normal, especially this time of year, right? I mean, snow was falling in Detroit yesterday and You wouldn't have had that many fans there on a normal opening day with those weather conditions and that team being in a rebuild, but uh, it made for a lot of fun scenes around the league. Let's start with the first game of the day. Jays-Yankees. It was a Cole Ryu pitching matchup, so it was a great one for everyone to sort of break their teeth on to start the season. What stood out to you in that first game of the day? Well, I, you know, it's funny. Gary Sanchez got so cheap in drafts um, over the course of draft season that even though I was fading him at the beginning of draft season, at the end, I got, I think, two or three shares. Um, And I think he might hit 210, and that does make it a little bit tough on you um, in in batting average leagues. But um, looks like the power is back. And uh, I don't think, yes, you can overreact, but he hit the ball really hard. It was like 110 or something. Um, and, um, it also just reminds you, it's not necessarily like, Oh my God, you know, it's more like, Oh yeah, right. You know, there was the other Gary Sanchez other than last year. So I don't know. I don't want to, I, it's not really useful information because either you bought in or you didn't, I guess you could. And now is not the time to like send an offer over. No, no, but I was more in on Sanchez than out at the price. I felt like the batting average risk was fine. I'll take that from a catcher. The power is real. So a little bit of validation for me uh, being on Gary Sanchez, relatively speaking. I don't have him everywhere. I just, I think the flaws are worth it at the price because the run right. production to go with that power should be well above average, especially the price for the tank so hard. Yeah. But the real one was like, I think the, um, uh, the wish to go out and pip roster Julian Merriweather everywhere, uh, <laughs> which if you've been listening, you you know, we've been touting the praises of Julian Merriweather. The problem is I think that his usage, and this is why a lot of leagues, I think he's, you shouldn't pick him up because his usage suggests they held on to him in case they needed multiple innings. I think that they held on to him in case they needed two innings, right? Cause it's, they went into, uh, into extra innings. I think Dolis is next in line uh, in that bullpen. Yeah, I, I think that's probably the right way to look eighth. at it for now because Dolis ended up working the eighth in that matchup. Yeah. Joe Romano got the win in relief. And I, I think uh, as a group, I think we are pretty optimistic about the Jays relievers, even though it's a, a group of uh, not necessarily the most established relievers, right? It's not the dominant bullpen that pops into your head when you think of league's best bullpens, but I think they'll at least be an above average group. Their and, bullpen is better than their non reuse starters. In other words. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think the, the concern I would have for them, especially with the Hendricks injury being one shorter, not the Hendricks injury, uh, Yates. Kirby Yates injury. They're one shorter in the bullpen and the workloads are going to catch up to that bullpen. If those starters, this are is not going short. Kirby. This is not Kirby. <laughs> Do people get that wrong? I, sh- I shoehorned that in. Yeah, you you really wanted to show the Pikachu shirt there. So. <laughs> Glad you uh, got it some FaceTime. So uh, Julian Merriweather save. You know, exciting for you in deeper leagues where you have him. Not necessarily a guy you're picking up 
right away. Maybe an AL only staff filler would probably be where the line is still drawn from him. A pretty good opening day start from Garrett Cole. But great arm. So like in a league, if it's really deep and you got a deep bench and you can stash someone like, yeah, great arm. Yeah, absolutely. The velo was definitely there. I think he had the third fastest pitch thrown in the game. Cole had the first two, but Julian Merriweather topping out at 99.1. So uh, definitely uh, a nice opener for him. Cole did Cole things, you know, eight Ks over five and change looked pretty much like himself to me. So I don't know if there's a whole lot else in this game that we need to uh, dig into, but I thought the, the Detroit Cleveland game ended up being a lot more fun. Cause I didn't know that weather was going to be that bad until we started to see highlights from it. If you haven't seen it, look for the Miguel Cabrera highlight. He homered in this game and slid into second base because it was snowing so hard. He couldn't see the ball clear the outfield wall. Uh, so kind of a fun moment for Miggy there. And I believe it was Jason Stark who pointed this out on Twitter. That was Miguel Cabrera's first opening day home run since 2008. Seems kind of odd. I mean, obviously a lot of peak years still in that range. So, uh, Dude, that was the second thing that had happened for the first time since 2008 yesterday. Because I did a little research for uh, Trent Rosecrans. And Joey Votto popped up twice in his game. And that was the first time that had happened since 2008. So no country for old men, I guess. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, what else hasn't happened in 13 years? It's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> Gregory Soto got the save. And I was recording at the time this game ended. And then I was tweeting at you about it. I said, hey, Gregory Soto. And I, I put the Linda Belcher gif on there because... That's the inside joke, I guess, at this point. But uh, you told me not to look at the outing. So how bad <laughs> was it in terms of what don't, was actually I was like, happening? don't look at anything else. Just look at the save. I mean, he gave up a homer, gave up two hits. One of them was a hard hit. Uh, didn't strike out a guy. Um, it's one of those things where you just like, you hope it was just a bad outing. Because I would say that uh, one thing that, that people might rush to take away from this is that Shane Bieber's velo was down. Uh, he gave up a homer. He gave up three runs. Matthew Boyd's uh, velo was down. Um, Greg Soto didn't really um, finish the game well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things you could try and take away from this. It was like, like you said, man, it was like inclement weather. Um, and I remember kind of, overreacting to some cold weather velo in the past. And I even looked into it and velo wasn't down that big across all cold weather, but I think there are sort of like layers of cold weather. There's like, Oh, it's a little bit nipply. And then there's like, we are in a blizzard. What, <laughs> what is going on here? Um, so I'm willing to give Bieber a pass for the low velo in the first outing, especially when, since we didn't really hear about it all spring. I'm willing to give Boyd a little pass on that. And I'm hoping that this is just one of those ugly saves that gives Gregory Soto another chance. And then in the next one, he strikes out two clean slate. Um, you know, looks looks more presidential as it were as it would be. If a player's stability in the closer role were a vending machine, I would say what Gregory Soto did on opening day was the first push to start rocking it back and forth to tip it over and mm. for someone who's more established the first push doesn't happen on an opening day with a bad outing right we'll get to right. wins in a few minutes Soto like Alex, is that marginal <laughs> right Alex Colome doesn't quite have that happening just yet but for Gregory Soto brand new closer yeah things get a little bumpy right away if you prefer boat analogies the boat is starting to rock a little bit so <laughs> he can settle it down he can get the vending machine back on all four legs he can get the boat you know nice and steady with a couple of clean outings and i think in terms of pure stuff is it fair to say he has the best stuff in the tigers bullpen at this point yeah i think so cisnero is is decent um as well uh but cisnero for example in a win was used in the seventh so uh daniel norris is your setup guy i've always liked daniel norris that was before we knew that he's a guy that lives in a van which you know i just don't see him as a as the next closer though no i want to see what when they use fulmer next i want to see what how they use him 
I'm a little bit intrigued by Fulmer as a reliever. I think that could actually work. And if Soto, in fact, does tip the vending machine over, Michael Fulmer could be there to <laughs> like pick up all the knowledge. Snickers bars. I had bars. a friend, I had a friend in, in college who the vending the vending machine dropped on his on his leg. Oh, jeez, <laughs> that's and, that and of course we all wanted to scatter. <laughs> we weren't doing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, vending machines just tip themselves over all the time. So I'm sure no one you were with had anything to do with that thing falling over. <laughs> I, 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 I bit the bullet, and even though I thought I might get in trouble, I was like, "This guy's hurting. I'm gonna stay here with him." <laughs> he had a big old bone bruise in his thigh. Uh, but don't uh, don't drop Shane Bieber. <laughs> right? Don't drop Shane Bieber. I'm glad we could twelve could help twelve strikeouts in six. Innings. It turns out he's still pretty good. Yeah, he uh, is going to be fine. Uh, I, I think the the one thing I would ask you, you know, just as a broader question, as we keep going through games, does lineup position matter to you on opening day? I mean, you have to account for the handedness of the opposing pitcher, of course, and think about it more like that. But do you start to look at the initial lineups and say, okay, this is a pretty good window into how the team is viewing where these players belong at least for the start of the year i think you'll have to also look in tandem with uh the handedness of the opposing hitter um i mean the opposing pitcher and so i think that will come up with another name unless we want to transition to that uh rockies game you were mentioning yeah, let's go. Let's go there. We don't have to go in in perfect order. Perfect I mean, order. All right. Let's just jump over to that one because um, I think we were talking about this. Uh, Josh Fuentes um, had the uh, two hole, mm-hmm. but and as much as I think uh, Josh Fuentes is kind of interesting, and I picked him up in a short term league. Um, who's hurt? That's allowing him to play. Oh, Rogers. So they're playing McMahon at second. Um, But Fuentes is, I'm just making sure this, I don't, you know, don't say something stupid, but I'm guessing he's a righty. Yes. So Fuentes is a righty. I doubt that he's necessarily batting second against non left handers. Um, And it looks like uh, the Rockies have convinced themselves they're the new Rays. (laughs) <laughs> and so they're going to platoon all over <laughs> this new thing called platooning. Hey, they won. They won yesterday. We can't. We can't. We can't. Take them down. We can still. We can still uh, kick them. Um, the <laughs> because they didn't start my damn Sam Hilliard, man. I guess Hampson one for three with two runs and a walk. I guess. I guess they were right. Hilliard against Kershaw is a tough matchup, but. I think you would find a way for Hilliard to get into the game later against Urias. He's oh, oh good. yeah, or 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 like bring him in, sub him in. Yeah, instead they subbed McMahon in, uh, and Jonathan Daza. Yeah, I don't know if we're ever going to. Somebody make... was making the point that this is a really bad lineup. Mm-hmm. It's a very bad line. Jeff Zimmerman and Coors isn't necessarily. But and Coors isn't necessarily um, the uh, Coors isn't necessarily the like a it doesn't get it doesn't make home runs happen at least. Well, yeah, I I think, Um, but I think you're still going to throw great pitchers in there even when the Rockies are good and the Rockies are bad right now. So it's just a question of how far down your ranks are you willing to go throwing pitchers in Colorado. Like that's, that's a little more of an open question now than it has been in past years. When you knew before, like most years when they were good, Blackman at his peak, Arenado there, right? You'd look at that lineup and say, yeah, I'm, I'm not really throwing anyone, but like a top five. Or I'm top almost not throwing anybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. 10. Yeah. <laughs> but in most circumstances this but year, Kershaw more aggressive. did get rocked. Kershaw got rocked, didn't have a called strike or whiff percentage over 30% on any of his three pitches. Uh, gave up max exit velocities over 100 on the slider and the four seam. Uh, sat 91. I don't know, man. It's still pretty tough out there, I guess. 
Yeah, but I think the, the main takeaway here, does lineup position matter on opening day? I mean, yes, a little bit. It could be an indicator that they really believe in the platoon of McMahon and Fuentes being uh, something that keeps Ryan McMahon from playing against lefties. You know, if, if Brendan Rodgers were there... This is going to be annoying as heck. If Brendan Rodgers were there, Chris Owings maybe doesn't play. Maybe they just... They found it. a way to get Chris Owings into the game instead of putting McMahon or Hillary in. And I, I guess it worked out, but that means that you downgrade Hampson, Hampson, Hilliard, Fuentes, McMahon, all of them. Yeah. Well, it was a None possibility of them is a starting going in. Is, a, is an every down back. <laughs> and if you're in a weekly league, they're they're kind of like they're 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 borderline plays anyway because they're not good bats, right? They're, they're okay, right? If you were like, okay, every time they have five games of Coors, I'm going to play them. Good. Except like with Hilliard this week, he had four games in Coors. And I was like, okay, I'll start him. Well, I didn't in the end. I ended up putting people like Brian Reynolds and even Rowdy Telez in over Sam Hilliard, even though he's home for four because he was only going to play two of them. Yeah, that's frustrating because... My argument would be, instead of trying to mix and match, instead of trying to be the Rays or the A's or a team that has that sort of lefty-righty balance at the positions where you're a little bit weaker, develop the players. Let the let Ryan McMahon have a shot against lefties. So you're not winning games is not the goal here. Player development is the goal. And if you can give a player who hasn't been getting opportunities against lefties, give those players those opportunities, you might be surprised at what happens. You might see a little bit of growth. You might see a guy that becomes an everyday player instead of a big side platoon guy. But I don't know. They're just they're following a script without knowing like why they're following it, I guess, is, is what they're <laughs> kind of trying to do there. So The Rays did it. Yeah, I mean, like I, it, it's a smart tactic, but it's just like you should be doing it for the purpose of something. If you're trying to win games, great. You're trying to win games, but they can't possibly think they're going to contend in that division. Uh, Austin Barnes started for the Dodgers. I believe he's basically the personal catcher for for Clayton Kershaw, right? So that's that's not a sign that Will Smith isn't going to start. They did say something about it maybe, maybe being more closer to 50-50 than people thought. Every time, but every single time that Dave Roberts talked about Will Smith, he was lowering Will Smith's playing time. It was very strange. I don't think I believe it. <laughs> I don't have uh, compelling evidence to. They to have said this in the past, where like, you know, you saw Grandal, you know, sit for Barnes in the postseason, and then they would talk about, oh, we're really trying to mix in Barnes. We're really trying to mix in Barnes, and then Grandal, you know, you know, usually got his 500 plate appearances. Yeah, I mean, Will Smith played 37 games last year, right? Barnes played 20. Two, something like that. He was hurt for a little while, I think. 29. So 60 40. I mean, if it's 60 40, that's pretty typical. But that was with a universal DH last year, too. So I, oh, I, right. think I think they'll scale back Barnes a little bit more. He's a good defender, but I wouldn't look at him starting on opening day and be worried if I had Will Smith. And I think I had, I don't think I have Will Smith. They could have used one more bat yesterday in the end. And they actually brought Will Smith in for a little bit, but he didn't get a plate appearance. Yeah. So. Uh, Interesting stuff there in the Rockies-Dodgers matchup. Let's get to the Brewers and Twins. I thought this one was over. (laughs) I thought the Twins had it in the bag. They were on their A bullpen, lined it up the way they wanted. I switched it off. I I took Hazel to the park and started listening to the game because I had (laughs) some stuff I had to do. Like, oh, the sun's going to go down soon. I'll listen to Uke on the radio and, you know, better luck next time. Uh, But they they rallied and I enjoyed enjoyed the rally on the radio. The Twins went with Rodgers in the seventh, Hansel Robles in the eighth, and Colome in the ninth. But I'm not looking at the Twins on any given day and saying that's the pattern because they, I think, are the team most likely to be like the Rays start to finish with how they handle their late inning relievers. The Twins could be one of those teams that have six different guys get a save between now and the end of the season. I think that's true. Um, but it is interesting that Colome and Mark Melanson um, keep getting closing opportunities, even though their strikeout totals are mediocre, um, and that the cutter uh, dampens exit velocity when you look at pitch types, and they're both cutter first guys. Uh, even in yesterday's not great game, 
column A's average exit velocity. He, someone did hit his cutter 110, but the average exit velocity on his cutter was 84, suggesting that there was a few that were way lower. Yeah, the min was 48.5. So he saws people off with that cutter, and he still does. One thing that, that stood out for me um, when I, I ran – uh, spin rates uh, from this year and last year. Just wondering, because you know, I did have a couple of DMs of like, "Hey, are people getting shelled today because their spin rates are down?" Yeah, and uh, and because you know they're, they're cracking down on on uh, on on pitch grip stuff, so they're not using it. Um, and uh, I would say that's you know, from what I see, it's not the case. Uh, Column A was one of. Let's see here. 12 pitchers that lost more 200 or more RPM on their spin on their uh, fastball. Um, but a lot of those guys did not were relievers, did not throw fastballs as their primary pitch. Um, and. Um, uh, I don't know. I like the names on the list of people who lost uh, fastball spin rate are not the reason like not the reason that people got shelled. Like if you think about like a, a, an ace that got shelled, they didn't lose their spin rate. The people who lost spin rate were Adam Simber, Tyler Rogers, who does, does he even want, he wants lower spin rates. I think he, you know, uh, Chichi Gonzalez probably wants lower spin rates, Kyle Cody <clears throat> and Alex Colome who threw three fastballs. So when I did a weighted uh, difference, in terms of who, like what the spin, if spin rate was down as a whole, you know, weighted, it was minus 11. And that is not significant. Um, and, you know, the only sort of significant starting pitcher that I saw that was anywhere close to 200 was Zach Greinke at minus 194. Um, I suppose it's possible, but there's also the question of velocity. And I pr probably still want at least two starts to say, uh, two appearances to say anything really definitive about this. But if I, if I had to guess right now, I'd say no. And also I was watching the games and there were plenty of people still touching the, the bills, of their hats. Yeah. Also uh, Velo was good for a lot of pitchers. I, Josh Hader topped out at 99.6 Woodruff topped out at 99.2. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was in the high nineties a lot yesterday. I wondered how much Hater talked about it after the game. I saw a quote from him having fans back in the stadium, maybe add a little adrenaline for some players and being back in their home stadiums for the it, first it was time. It's bizarre fans, because like, I'm mean, in Oakland. It, I went to the game last night. It was, you know, they, it was a sellout, quote unquote, uh, at 20 percent, 10,000 people. Um, and it was one of those crowds where you could hear. I mean, the Astros were in town, too. So, like, they were heckling mm -hmm. constantly. What was funny about it was you could hear every single heckle. Like you could hear specifically <laughs> what they were saying, you know? That's and like, like a fall league environment with 10,000 people. That's kind of cool, actually. Yeah. So I heard some very specific ones like, nobody likes you, Alex Bregman. <laughs> just very. He feeds off that stuff, though. That Damn. guy, that guy doesn't care. Like, I mean, Maybe on like a really personal level, like if, if someone he cared about said they didn't like him and no one liked him, then it would bother him. But I think he feeds off of it. I think he has this uh, this side where he likes being a villain. He homered in that game. Oh by the yeah, way. it's oh, yeah. uh, it's. I mean, he funny. took me aside in the in the in the clubhouse one day and was like, "Tell me why defensive metrics are wrong and I should be an MVP candidate." <laughs> and I was like, "Well, <laughs> they might be." They might be wrong. You, you do a lot of shifting. They throw out all the shifts. There was one that was like, uh, whatever his wife's name was, Bregman's wife. And she married a cheater. <laughs> but oh, uh, I wouldn't say they're not in midseason form yet. Ha having been a heckler in my past, and I apologize profusely for all the things I said at Stanford basketball again. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, uh, I would say that they were not in midseason form. We've lost the plot. Oh, spin rates. Yes, I don't think Alex Colomay's spin rate on his forcing being down means that he used to use goop and doesn't anymore or that, that there's a general problem with that in baseball. No, I don't think it means that either. Byron Buxton hit a really long home run in that game. 456 feet. He got a 77, like a 75 mile an hour just grooved pitch from Eric Yardley and 
killed it. Uh, and Daniel Vogelbach. Not, not the, the hardest hit ball. hit ball in the game. No, Vogelbach had the hardest hit ball in that game. He did, into the ground, though. Yeah, hey, you know what? We'll launch it next time. Unfortunately, Josh Donaldson left early with an injury, so we'll see if that turns into an IL situation. I was wondering if they would bring Alex Kirilov up right away if Donaldson misses time because Arias would have to play a lot of third base, and you don't really want to play Jake Cave. Like, you can't, if you're the Twins, you can't really afford to take a big hit offensively for a couple of weeks. Like, you need Kirilov up there to replace Donaldson's offensive production. So, I think there's at least a chance if, if Donaldson hits the IL that we'll see Kirilov a little sooner than previously planned. Here's a weird quirk in the box score. It has Luis Arias listed as only playing third base the whole game mm. in the first spot. And then in the second spot, it has Josh Donaldson playing third base and giving in to Jake Cave in left field. So what happened was Luis Arias was listed as the left fielder, but he never played there because Donaldson got hurt in his first plate appearance. Mm. That's a pretty weird. So it really quirk. should say LF3B, but he never played there. I don't know. I, like I'm not a. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna yell at anybody about this. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know if it's wrong. I think it could be right. <laughs> I think you might have. I think this might be right, but uh, it does look like they had two third basemen for the game, which is weird. I would agree. I don't think they would want to start Jake Cave a lot. And the easiest way to get more offense back is uh, Alex Kirloff. Donaldson, it was the hamstring, not the calf. However, it's just really uh, old man-itis. And uh, you're just hoping that it's, uh, you know, not a DL stick. Yeah, old man legs, unfortunately, mm-hmm. for Josh Donaldson at this stage. Dinner time can be chaotic, but with Freshly, it's easy. Their chefs take care of your meals a few nights a week and take the pressure off you. Freshly offers chef-made, nutrient-packed, delicious meals delivered fresh to your door, no cooking required. Grocery shopping and cooking can be a pain, especially right now. And with Freshly, you don't have to do it. Your meals arrive cooked and fresh every week, so you can keep your fridge stocked and skip the trip to the store. Ordering is easy. Visit Freshly.com and choose from over 30 delicious, satisfying, better-for-you meals like steak peppercorn, sausage baked penne, or their chicken pesto bowl. Freshly can fit your lifestyle with a variety of plans and meals to pick from that work for your dietary needs, preferences, tastes, and family size. Right now, Freshly is offering our listeners $40 off your first two orders when you go to Freshly.com slash rates. Stop stressing about dinner. Go to Freshly.com slash rates for $40 off your first two orders. That's Freshly.com slash rates for $40 off your first two orders. Stressed out and can't relax? Take an Eagle Moon Hemp CBD gummy to unwind. Use code ATHLETIC for 30% off CBD site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com slash shop. They already have the best prices online and in stores. And trust me, you don't want to miss on these discounts. That's 30% off site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com slash shop. All Eagle Moon Hemp products are vegan, low sugar, use organic practices, and are made from award-winning crop. Just in case you didn't know, CBD is not marijuana. It does not get you high. CBD may help to relieve pain, nausea, seizures, anxiety, and depression. Get 30% off all CBD products site-wide at eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Their products are pure, proven, lab-tested, and superior to other CBD on the market. And the best part is, they are way less in price. Throw in the discount code and you're practically getting a product for free. That's eaglemoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Try them out while winning free products. Just go to their Facebook page, leave a review, or follow them on Instagram. Winner is chosen each week and sent a free product. Check them out and let us know how you like them. That's egomoonhemp.com with the promo code ATHLETIC. Let's get to the Cubs-Pirates matchup. You know, uh, Dustin Fowler had the hardest hit ball in that game. Blast from the past uh, with uh, (laughs) Fowler getting this opportunity in Pittsburgh. Quite a few roster adjustments. Brian Goodwin was the guy that they let go at the end of spring, so... At least for now, it's going to be Fowler, Jared Oliva, the guy we're sort of waiting on to get an opportunity in Pittsburgh at some point in the next few weeks. Uh, But the guy that kind of stood out for a lot of people was David Bednar. And I think he came up on this show as either a deep, deep sleeper or a possible fallback option if Richard Rodriguez falters or gets traded at some point. And I think he opened a lot of eyes with that opening day performance. Yeah, I mean, he was in that trade... uh... With yeah, the, the Musgrove deal. Ah, right. And so um, part of the, the, the sort of 
quantity over quality approach, but looked pretty quality. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that he was on my radar. I just didn't know how close he was to the end of that bullpen. And I will have to admit, it is nice that he, uh, sat 96, um, and, uh, got a bunch of whiffs on the curveball and splitter, um, did not get any whiffs on the fastball or called strike. So a little bit uh, wild. The other thing is Kyle Crick is away from the team with mono. Um, I, I still think Richard Rodriguez is a closer. There are some people out there who still think Kyle Crick is the closer. He just has COVID. Um, so I would say, I still think it's Richard Rodriguez. I think there's like a fair amount of inertia in this closer thing, especially if like everything's going okay, where you say, uh, oh, well, we're not going to mix things up. Kyle, we're going to get you into the eighth and stuff. So I think that'll push Bednar further away is my long-winded way of saying. Bednar looks close. He's good. I think once Kyle Craig comes back, he's in, he's he steps back one. Yeah, I think he's more of a watch list guy that could end the year as the Pirates closer as opposed to yeah. someone we're going to be bidding on in, in fab pickups in the next couple of weeks. But certainly looks like a nice piece in that Pittsburgh bullpen. Uh, this was one of the games I didn't really get a chance to look very closely at. A couple hard hit balls from Rizzo. Brian Hayes hit the ball hard three times. That's encouraging. This Pirates lineup, as we pre- you know, kind of predicted or talked about a few times, play any pitcher you want against them. Like I, I know they, they put five runs on the board on opening day. They chased Kyle Hendricks early. Hendricks only went three, you know, gave up three Command runs. wasn't quite there. Which is weird for Hendricks, like to, for him to have an off day. It was a little cold, so cold early in how the season. Much, how much that played into it, but I'm looking at this Pirates lineup and I'm having a hard time thinking of a pitcher I've rostered that I wouldn't want to start against them right now. And even though it ended up being a five three game, I think that Cold Wrigley is still a decent place to uh, look for early starts. Uh, oh yeah, because Cool was like couldn't find the strike zone in the first inning. And I thought, Oh God, this is going to go terribly. But in the end, uh, the box score, you know, for cool was okay. You know, two strikeouts, three walks, one run and three innings, uh, one earned run and three innings. Like, you know, it wasn't terrible that, 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 that you get out of that with that. Uh, I think it speaks a little bit to how cold and, 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 uh, uncomfortable it was for hitters. So, Hey, Hayes did take him deep and in the end, uh, but it was a four hour affair with lots of different pitchers. Um, and uh, I wouldn't take away anything other than cold Wrigley is a good place to stream. Arietta is still a good stream. Um, you know, I still think that there's some good uh, pirates you can stream in these. I think they'll generally be lower scoring games. Yeah. I think that all checks out for me to just falls in line with my expectations. Uh, Braves Phillies. Interesting matchup here. Gene Segura ended up uh, winning this one with the walk-off hit. I know he's a guy that you've got a bunch of places, so that definitely makes you happy. Boom, but boom, uh, boom. awesome stolen Ryland. base. <laughs> John Segura, stolen base. Do you know how rare stolen bases are? Have you st- like? It's now the number one thing I look for in a box score. I scan both sides immediately for a stolen base, and most of the time, it's zeros. <laughs> right you just get in Let's there look at this box score who was running who was who, ran? who ran? Bases? nobody 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 you know what i look for actually Figure too it. though when i when i look for stolen bases i want to know who was behind the plate and who was pitching when it happened because that might actually mm. lead you to where the next stolen bases are coming from it's not always just I, this yeah, guy are ran being super opportunistic about him yeah yeah it's like uh, i think at the beginning of last year remember tommy fam was running all over the d-backs i think it was carson kelly who was behind the plate and i thought oh okay i'm gonna keep an eye on who's got the d-backs in these next couple series and you know if there's a fringy player that i need to put in my lineup or pick up off the wire i'm gonna see if that's a way to get a few extra saves or steals rather so it, it's just it's one of those things that you can you kind of poke into a little bit and actually find some sneaky good matchups that people don't usually look for. I got to complain about the Savant box scores, man. No steals. No steals. Yeah. It's obviously made by nerds. And I say that affectionately. <laughs> yeah. Cause Freed's, they're not, they're not that, 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 uh, they're not that interesting, but Nola shoved Freed shoved 
One stolen base in the whole game. Alvarado Jose. pitched the eighth. He did, and Neris was named the closer, I believe, before the game. So after all of that, after after all the speculation that Bradley, when he went there, he was going to become the guy that Alvarado made the most sense. They go back to the the old standby with Neris. I would he, say he that good. he was good this spring. Neris, Alvarado is next. Yeah. Almost always the eighth inning guy replaces the ninth inning guy. Like usage in in season closer changes are totally predicted by uh, by who's pitching the eighth almost. If there's any doubt, then you can like if there's two people pitching the eight, then you start to go into handedness, velocity, and strikeout rate and that sort of stuff. But Alvarado's next. Naris can hit a bout of wildness at any moment, so I think he's even if he is a closer, I think he's a, a bottom third closer. Or what do you think? Yeah, no, 15, I think ten to fifteen, like twenty 15 to twenty. Twenty is kind of yeah. where he tops out. I actually see a lot of similarities between Naris and Matt Barnes. I think they could be yeah. above average strikeout rates. If they're Through good, they could be as good as anybody. But if they're bad, they're atrocious. I mean, Neris's year-to-year ratios are all over the road. Uh, we saw a 510 ERA, a 130 whip back in 18, a 293 and a 102 the year he had 28 saves in 2019, and a 457 with a 171 whip last season. Great this spring, though. So at least in good form to start the year. And I would agree with you. I think... The other thing that's caught my ear when the Phillies are talking about their bullpen, they lean into Archie Bradley as a multi-inning guy a lot. Like that's just been something that they've they've made a point to talk about on multiple occasions. So I think that also makes me think they want to use him a little more flexibly, like sixth and seventh, right? You know, one in the third, one Why? in the third. It's been so it's been a while since he's been a starter. He doesn't really have he has two pitches. I don't know. There's something about him that they they like to use him a little more than the other guys. So maybe his velo doesn't drop off, or maybe he has slightly he probably has better command. I mean, he's better command than Naris and Alvarado. Yeah. So you can leave him in there for four or five, six outs in some cases, whereas the other guys you want to go three. Three balls hit over 108, which is the kind of a magic number for Max Exit Velo. Two of them by Austin Riley. Mm-hmm. The, the Austin Riley hype train continues. Uh They'll have to make considerable room for Pablo Sandoval on that hype train. <laughs> he homered, by the way. <laughs> I'm sorry. He scored all. He he hit in all of the runs for the Braves. I didn't expect Pablo Sandoval to find playing time there at all. Yeah, me neither. That's but, very weird. So I'm I'm, I'm going to not read much into that. I think NL only. Very last guy on your roster. That's as far as I'm willing to go if everybody else is still healthy. Oh, one thing to learn. I was going to say not much else to learn. One thing to learn. Adam Hazley started in the center. He did. Although it was against a lefty. Is Adam Hazley a righty, though? No, I'm pretty sure Hazley's a lefty. That's a really big deal then, kind of. Well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think I think that speaks to... Their yeah. lack of defensive. That's options. a big deal. He's a starting center fielder. He's a starting center fielder. Boom. Yeah. We got a couple of shares of that. <laughs> Whoo. Oh, wait, we're not supposed to overreact, but I still think Hazley in against the lefty. Big deal. Well, yeah. I mean, it could be more playing time than expected. The very it looks least- like Quinn is the defensive replacement. And that's I sort mean, of like, that's how he more. hits. That's he's not he's not enough of a hitter to play yeah. much more than that. Unfortunately, it'd be fun if he did because he will steal bases when he gets chances to do it. Uh, let's go to the D backs and Padres. Uh, Madison Bumgarner quickly showing us again why we don't want to use low end mid range starters even against the Padres. It's just obviously not the Padres teams we're used to. Yeah, Petco is still a great place to pitch, but. That lineup can do damage, and they did plenty of it. 8-7, nice high-scoring game in San Diego in the opener. Uh, Eric Hosmer, a guy that I think I have absolutely nowhere. Homer's on opening day after <laughs> pounding the ball into the ground all spring. So that Against a good. lefty. Yep. Oh, yeah. Things are, things are looking real good. There's uh, something else that we have to learn from this. Eno is a genius. 
And and why is that? Tell Marte. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'll do a victory lap after a four for five opening day with a home run and two batted balls over 105 miles an hour. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not above that. Sometimes it's just nice to see someone you have like eight shares of uh, do really well. Uh, Josh Rojas starting at second at shortstop is interesting. Um, do you think that he, I think he starts at second once Nick Ahmed is healthy. Yeah. Yeah. Because the, the defense alone that Nick Ahmed provides that gets him in the lineup. He's, he's the guy as long as he's healthy. So I think that, but there was a little bit of a, like, uh, undefined, uh, timing on Nick Ahmed, right? Like they were like, we don't know. Yeah. I mean, they gave him some platelets or something and. I think it's interesting, though, because Rojas is second base only in a lot of leagues to start the season. So if it ends up being even a week, then Rojas picks up shortstop to go with it. And it was an 0 for 5, but he was leading off. I think that I mean that was something they were doing in the spring, but they, <laughs> but they actually gave him the shot to do it on opening yeah. day, too. So yeah. I think he gets at least a little bit of run atop the order. If he slumps for, I don't know, a couple series, maybe they'll shuffle it up and drop him in the order, but he at least has that chance to really hold down that spot to begin the year. You know, I thought bum looked okay. I, I don't know. Uh, I don't, I think if he gets dropped in super deep leagues and he's not facing the Padres, I think he could be a decent streamer. I mean, he sat 90 plus, so at least it wasn't 88, 89. Uh, he had above a 30% called strikes and whiffs on the four seam cutter and curveball. Uh, he got plenty of whiffs on them, too. I don't know, man. 14 whiffs on 91 pitches. I think, like, he looked pretty good. He looked pretty good. Even though it's the hit that Hosmer got was kind of inside, I didn't expect it to go out. Yeah. So I'm wondering, I mean, day games play a little bit different than night games at Petco. So the ball could carry a little better, I think, in those conditions. Um, I do think the problem with Bumgarner is something we've hit on on a recent show. The Diamondbacks schedule for the entire month is pretty tough. I think he's the kind of guy that gets bounced from rosters a lot in the next couple of weeks. And then we get to May, the schedule gets a little easier, and he becomes a decent pickup that actually sticks around in some at least deeper mixed leagues. I don't know if we're at the point where Bumgarner is going to be stuck on someone's roster in a 12 team mixed league going forward. But I, I don't think he's as done as the opening day line would lead us to believe. Um, there's one yeah. pretty clear drop in this game. Uh, Stefan Crichton, he came in and was pitching in the sixth inning of this game. So if you thought he was going to be part of the saves picture in Arizona, that to me is early enough in the game. I'm going to say it's probably safe to let him go this weekend, barring, Something pretty unforeseen with his usage between now and Sunday. Were they even losing at the time? Yes, yeah. I believe they were. So I, I mean, mean, that's like, not good. It's not, not good to be used, used in a losing situation. A losing situation, not even, not even. I guess a little bit. Actually, earlier in a losing situation is better than the ninth inning. You know, down by four. Or whatever. So, right, like he's still. Peripheries, but he's not. He, I can't imagine he's their setup guy or their closer. Yeah, being I, used in, that, in that way. So hey, kudos to to the people who said Mark Melanson would close. Uh, I still think he's kind of bottom half closer as is because of the strikeout rate. Uh, Pomerantz is obviously next in line. I would say that uh, it's still worth uh, hoping uh, keeping Pomerantz around three strikeouts in an inning. Um, he's going to keep your, he's going to keep your ratios pristine, keep you strikeouts. Um, and he's next in line. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, like I'd rather have Drew Pomerantz than like Julian Merriweather. Uh, I'd rather have Drew Pomerantz than Jose Alvarado probably, although that one's closer. Um, do you have anyone else you want to throw in this, uh, random who would you rather? I'm trying to decide. Fly? if I would hold Pagan in any deeper mixed leagues or not, like if he's also a cut, I mean, he gets enough innings and the ratio should be good where I'd rather have Alvarado than Pagan. I'd rather be swimming upstream. I'd rather have the eighth inning guy than the seventh inning guy. Yeah. I suppose, I suppose in a mixed league, that's probably the move to make, but I think in, in deep performance, like NL, I've got, I've got Pomeranz and Pagan in NL only. They were cheap in labor. Mm. They're fine. Like it, 
Melanson could fall apart. That, that, I mean, Mark Melanson went from guy that we didn't think the Giants could possibly trade to guy that the Braves paid the rest of the deal for after trading for him, used him as their closer over a more skilled guy in Will Smith, and then he ended up on a good San Diego team. And got they did let him go, though. Day. They didn't have a closer necessarily, and they let him go. Yeah. So I don't know. The cutter, though, I think the cutter is somehow key to this. There's like the the Mariano Rivera, like chasing the Mariano Rivera um, profile, I guess. Anything else to learn? Him. I think Cronenworth might be their starting second baseman. Yeah, I I might have been wrong about Cronenworth throughout draft season. I'm at least opening my mind to that possibility. I can't, after one day, say I'm totally wrong. But it was put to me this way actually, during a draft on Thursday. It was, is the situation in San Diego one where we're making too much of how the playing time is actually being split up? Like, we're, we're, take, we're saying that Cronenworth doesn't have enough playing time, even though he can play all over. Like, we're, we're saying uh, he's, the, he's the ninth guy, he's the 10th guy, and teams play nine or 10 guys. Like, they're going to take all those playing time situations and it's like everybody 90 or 95 percent like that still adds up six and, starters are still valuable yeah 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 yeah. so it's like other than maybe tatis who will almost never come out of the lineup or machado like, as long as those guys are healthy they're going to play every day everybody else is going to get a little time off but well, that's fine because they're all going to should but they're, they're all going to get like <laughs> right but like 90 percent shares for everybody else 92 percent right. shares for everybody else that's still great for everybody else for profar for cronenworth so Maybe I miscalculated. Maybe I, I made too much of, of the depth yeah. they built. There was like a tweet out of like, you know, do you have any shot in like do any not shot in front of do you have any FOMO players? <laughs> and it I think it's a little bit weird to say, yes, Jake Cronenworth, you know, on a day when there are I'm sure there's other players that did well that I don't have any shares of. But for some reason looking at that, I was like, oh man, he was super cheap. And he's got a cool set of, of abilities, you know, in order to, he can make contact, has some power, can steal some bags. I could see him being on some winning teams at the end of the season where he only gets 500 plate appearances maybe, but he was super cheap and he got the person like a 280 average and, you know, 20 homers and 10 stolen bases anyway. You're just like, oh man, you got that for free. Yeah. That's always the one that bothers me. <laughs> It's never like a star that you paid top and then went and did star things. I'm always like, oh, you got that guy in the with a 300th pick. Yeah, it's those mid round guys that that got away that feel like you you missed the opportunity the most because they were so affordable. Well, look, no one's perfect. Even the best baseball players strike out with the bases loaded. The best golfers sometimes three putt with the tournament on the line. So if you feel like you come up short in the bedroom, sometimes it's perfectly okay. And if it's bothering you, there are options. Go to GetRoman.com slash rates now. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Getting started is simple. Just go to GetRoman.com slash rates and complete an online visit. Take care of your ED without leaving home. Complete an online visit today to connect with a doctor and take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash rates now to get $15 off your first month. Look, there's a straightforward way to take care of your ED. GetRoman.com slash rates. Get started now to save $15 on your first month of treatment. It's Final Four weekend, so it is a great weekend if you're a College Hoops fan, of course, with MLB season now underway. Tons to watch and plenty to bet on. If you're into College Hoops, our team here at The Athletic, it's bringing you all the latest news, trends, and insights on the Final Four, plus our picks for every single game still on the slate. And now we are partnering with BetMGM to bring you the best exclusive offer to bet alongside us and win. Right now, we're offering Rates and Barrels listeners a risk-free first bet up to $600. Just sign up at BetMGM.com and use the bonus code RATES to take advantage of this special offer from the King of Sportsbooks. This offer is for new customers. That's a risk-free first bet up to $600 at BetMGM.com with the bonus code RATES. Visit betmgm.com for terms and conditions. Must be 21 years of age or older to wager. Colorado, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Nevada, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia only. Excludes Michigan disassociated persons. Please gamble responsibly. 
Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, Nevada, and Virginia. 1-800-270-7117 for confidential help in Michigan. 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. And 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa. In Tennessee, call or text the red line at 800-889-9789. If you or someone you know has a gambling problem and wants help, call 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. Promotional offer not available in Nevada. And before we move on to our last topic, quick heads up. Check out the Ding You presented by BetMGM. They're covering all the action from the Final Four on the court and at the sports book, grabbing insight from the Athletics College basketball writers and picking the brain of BetMGM's top bookmakers. Check out the show on the Daily Ding podcast feed and streaming on YouTube. All right, you know, I want to talk about the Marlins-Rays game. If you like great pitching, that game absolutely delivered. Tyler Glass now looked fantastic. Uh, Sandy Alcantara pitched really well. I mean, just a one nothing game where Austin Meadows' solo home run was the only offense for either side. Eight combined hits in this game. Uh, but Glass now, the velocity, he topped out at 100.6 in his first start this season. Yeah, and I was actually even more impressed by how many sliders he threw. He threw more sliders than curveballs, and he's really, really taken to that pitch. Got 42% called strikes and whiffs on that. The average on called strikes and whiffs, I think, is around 29. So did really well there. Wasn't hit hard. Uh, the max exit below on the slider was 91. Um, I think that, obviously, there's still some command issues, and I think that's a little bit risky to uh, you know, to go so hard in on a, on a pitch that has more side to side side movement than his uh, up down curveball when he has these histories of cur- of command issues, so there's a little bit of like, well, let's see what he does against another offense with that pitch. <laughs> Maybe a more patient offense um, would uh, would have some issues with it. Uh, would wouldn't have as many issues with it, but uh, five whiffs on the slider, two on the curveball. Uh, seven on the four seam fastball, nothing really hit hard. Just a really great outing uh, from glass. Now only 77 pitches to get those 18 outs as well. But I mean, Sandy Alcantara was just as good on the other side. Only allowed one more hit, two hits in six innings, seven K's from him, four hard hit balls. So a little more hard contact against him. But the big question throughout the off season was, are we going to get more K's and a matchup against this iteration of the race lineup doesn't fully answer that question because you go into a matchup with the Rays with your pitchers expecting a bump in K's. That was their big flaw throughout last season. That could change. Once we get to the point where if Francisco Mejia is playing more than Zanino, if we get Wander up, maybe we get Vidal Brujan up, you change that lineup a little bit and suddenly they could be closer to a league average team in that category. But until further notice, they're a team that you're going to pick on if you're searching for K's. Yeah, it's uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, it's also true. Uh, Tutsugo leading off, as they said, uh, the only caveat I have uh, to that is that uh, Choi will be back at some point and that also um, probably not against lefties. Probably a, a very different lineup against lefties. Probably get uh, Wendell in there. Uh, what else? What else changes against lefties? I mean, Brosso, they play. Brosso yeah, I think and Wendell, Mike Brasso would get in. Wendell, I, I don't know, man. I, I think Wendell's just an extra guy. Yandy Diaz started against a righty. That was kind of strange to see yesterday. I would have expected that to be Wendell. That's true. That's true. Um, but he also is often injured, so Wendell will have his uses this year. Um, I still have him as like an interesting jack of all trades, best ball, you know, bench type bench type piece that will have his weeks. Um, but uh, not a super big asset um, right now. Jess Chisholm debuted, hit sixth, hit ahead of Alfaro, ahead of Rojas, and obviously ahead of the pitcher spot as well. I like that from a lineup construction standpoint because one thing that's always bothered me is that you bring up a prospect and you think they're better than all but a handful of guys in your roster, but then you still hit them eighth. Oh, we got to ease them in. It's like, it's still the same pitcher they're going out there trying to hit. It's not, it's not making his job any easier hitting lower in the lineup. Like just hit also, him where he belongs. Like make your team optimal for how, how you want to play it. 
I think it does make it a little bit easier to put him ahead of the pitcher because he'll get some walks they wouldn't otherwise. But I don't think that it actually helps you evaluate the player. <laughs> like if you're in evaluation mode at all and you pump up their walk rate just by putting him in front of the in front of the pitcher. And then you're like, well, what is his actual walk rate? You know, like we, we saw that he... with uh, with Michael Franco a couple of years ago. Right. A guy that doesn't yeah. really walk a lot. They dropped him to the eight spot. He doubled his walk rate for a little while. And people Everyone thought, said, oh, he's got oh, new renewed patient. discipline. Yeah. I might even said that. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not hating on anybody. I'm just saying you got to think about that. Alcantara looks beautiful. Love him. <laughs> just really good velocity. What worked the forcing back in, which is I, which is where I thought if there was any upside left, it was working the forcing back in for some whiffs, because he, you know, met, made the switch to swinker f- sinker fine. But now you threw the forcing enough when you were throwing it primarily. Why don't you work it back in to, to add another wrinkle? Then he's a true four-pitch guy, decent command of all of them, sat 98. I mean, hey, come on. Let's get to the Reds-Cardinals game. Alex Ooh. Reyes just blowing up the velocity list. It was not a very one. good game. No, I mean, it was ugly. <laughs> 11-6 was the final. Eugenio Suarez homered but made two errors. I mean, it was it was a mess for the Reds. And Luis Castillo got rocked and that is definitely a concern but was there anything in those struggles that makes you think there's going to be a carryover problem do we see a velo drop or anything in the underlying numbers that would would give you some pause or do you think it was just a bad day that happened to be on opening day well i wanted to say with you know with balls and play down so much um and uh you know castillo being a strikeout pitcher even though he's also a ground ball pitcher i thought that the Suarez thing wouldn't affect him so much, but you just saw uh, how it happened. You know, you just saw that um, there was an error and then there was a homer. (laughs) It's just like, it's not necessarily always just the error. It's just like, it's another base runner, especially if it, if it like, it's somebody that should have been an out. So just flipping that switch from out to base runner um, is pretty devastating. Uh, Castillo also shows as being down in velo 2.6 miles an hour. That's a lot. Did he really sit 97.5 last year? Doesn't sound wrong. It doesn't sound wrong to you? 97.5? No, I I think he was throwing really hard last year. Well, we got to double check that. I'm doing it right now. But yeah, um, not a great start and it does make me wonder if uh it does make me wonder about um if the defense matters if 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 we should have thought more about that for for Castillo. Well, yeah, definitely definitely a concern coming out of the opener on that side. It wasn't a great day for Jack Flaherty on the other side either. 6 runs on just 4 and a third, uh, 4K is a couple home runs allowed. A lot of hard hit balls from Nick Castellano. Certainly a good sign if you had him uh, as a bounce back player this year. A lot of people did. I was a little more into Mike Moustakis, relatively speaking. Very into Nick Senzel. He hurt himself diving for a ball. No word yet how much time he's going to miss, but uh, they said it was a shoulder injury when he left. Jonathan India debuted, hit seventh in the order, went two for four with the double, had a hard hit ball sprinkled in there as well too. So I, I don't know. I don't know what plan B shuffling big league parts around would actually be like, I think they have to stick with this for a while unless they're going to go all glove and bring up Garcia hey, crap, dude, or go to farmer. Castillo has been sitting above 97 this whole time. Yeah. He throws really hard. He sat 93 yesterday. That's such I'm a drop. Really worried, man. Well, That's a big drop. I'm, I mean, I'm worried, and I'm. It's the kind of drop that makes you wonder: was the tech working correctly? Like, was was there something not calibrated right? I mean, was I, we'd see with other pitchers though too. If that were the case, you'd see bigger drops on a guy's well, flarity. And I'm seeing some pretty big drops. Yeah, there's a fairly big drops on everybody. Was it a cold game? So flarity uh, was down 1.5. Uh, Tyler Webb was down 1.5. Ryan Helsley is a fireballer, 
but he was down on the four seam one. Genesis Cabrera was down two. Gallegos was down 1.2. Come on. Alex Reyes was down almost one. Okay. So let's say we can take one of those and just take it off of his ledger. That's still another everybody big was drop, down though. one. But yeah. You, you need to give him one and a half. Like you're still, you, yeah, you lost a lot more than big. that. Well, okay. So my over under on his fastball next time out is 94 5. And that's still, that's still not 96, 97 like it used to be. Ah, man. It might be, might be a long year in Cincinnati, man. That's, uh, I feel for our friend Clay Link. <laughs> he loves that team and he's, he's just stuck, just stuck with them right now. They were, they were so exciting going into last season, too. India well, did well. Yeah. Yeah. Two for four with a, Hard hit ball, a double in there. So nice day for him. Probably the weirdest game of the day. Royals Rangers, 24 runs combined. Like what oh on Lord. earth happened there? I mean, uh, the interesting thing for me in the underlying numbers, Carlos Hernandez, the velo leader on the Kansas City side, but there's not much you can do with him from a fantasy perspective in the short term. Like he's doesn't seem to be close to saves. And he doesn't not seem- a very good pitcher either. I think he just throws hard. <laughs> right. I don't think he's like close to getting more innings or anything, but no. Ugh, just one of those guys that it- Santana hit two balls 110. Yep. Power still That's there. That's pretty for him. exciting. Uh one thing I did want to say uh, on the bullpen side is um that uh, it was interesting that Holland came in with a ton of runs, but then they went to Wade Davis when it got tight. So there wasn't officially a uh, there wasn't officially a save chance in this game, but looks like it's Wade Davis and then Greg Holland. I I don't know though because they didn't even use Stomont. Did they did they send Stomont down? I don't think they. I didn't see that note if they did, which is weird because so many guys pitched yesterday. Like how would he have not pitched? That's what I'm saying. What were they saving for? They think he's a in losing games guy. No, you know what? They were winning by too much to use him. That might be the answer. So he might be the setup guy. Greg Holland might be the mop up guy. Could be. Yeah, with that big of a lead. He was supposed to come in and just get some work, man. And then, look, I don't think. There's any delivery that I dislike more than Greg Collins. <laughs> this whole thing, he like slaps his glove together and then he falls down. Not good. It's the weirdest thing. If I saw someone do that, I'd be like, yo, you are never going to have command, which he never has. Uh, I don't even know how he throws it hard. It looks like he's falling down. It's so bizarre. Anyway, I'm not in on Holland. I don't think, I don't think that Holland is a setup guy. That's what I'm trying to say. Don't overlearn on this one. Because it was uh, a wipeout game until it got a little bit close at the end. I mean, there were some. So I think gross pitching. Stomont setup game. guy and Wade Davis, bottom five closer. Yeah, and even that, like by Monday, things could look different, and Davis could be nowhere near the ninth inning. The Royals messed around a lot with that pen last year, so it's one of the places that I was very hesitant to even throw darts in during draft season for all the hits in this game. Leody Tavares, 0 for 5, 4K as he was hitting 8th. They had him hitting 8th behind Eli White, who was DHing, and then Isaiah Kiner White was, was the leadoff guy. And Eli White uh, is the other center fielder, even though he's DHing. And Eli White had two hits and a walk. Um, and they're excited enough about him to say, his manager said, I wanted to get Eli White in on opening day. Yeah. You know? So uh, I have a feeling that Eli White is going to be the starting center fielder there after, for not, 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 not long from now. And that Guzman, who they always love, irrationally perhaps, but also had a great spring in terms of Exavilo, that they're going to find a way to get Guzman in there, DH, while Calhoun is out. So I wouldn't even be surprised if today's lineup, or I don't know if they're playing today, but the next lineup has uh, Tavares, out and Guzman in. Guzman uh, the other, in white and center, yeah. Two names on the Royal side that 
stuck out for me, Isbell and Taylor. Uh, I've loved Taylor and he had two hard hits, uh, three hits overall. Uh, you know, that was good. And then Kyle Isbell in his debut three for five with a hard hit. Rumble, young man, rumble. This is not a bad lineup, and it was Never on a day a. without Adalberto Mondesi. He's got that oblique injury, so they had to play Nicky Lopez, and you know Lopez, whatever, nine hitter, empty bat. But it, one through eight, that's not bad. It was Witt, Benintendi, Santana, Sal, Soler, Dozier, Isbell. I yeah. think could be a nice piece. And as you said, Taylor, I, probably a little undervalued. I mean, great defender, a, but has some power, has some speed too. Yeah. And he's a big swing or miss guy. So, like, that's actually pretty great to have in the eighth home, right? It's like, oh, he didn't do anything. Turn the lineup over. Let's start again. Oh, he hit the homer, you know? Bam. Now it's a big game, you know? Um, I, yeah, this is a good lineup. I'm disappointed in Brad Keller. I, I thought that this was a bad Texas lineup. And at home, I didn't see enough of him because he pitched one and a third and I was like watching other games and I switch over and he was out already. So uh, I would have to say he gets a mulligan though. I think he's earned a couple more turns through the lineup, through the rotation. Just probably, brutal. probably true of Gibson too, but we got a, we got a couple more games to get to real quick. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Got to fly through these angels, white Sox. From the the late night viewing, anything catch your eye in that one? I like that Luis Robert. Uh, <laughs> there is a T in there. Uh, did uh, stole base, stolen base. Uh, Max Stasi home run, bang bang boom. Uh, Dylan Bundy and uh, uh, Lucas Giolito. That was pretty much a pitching duel. I I know that like. There were some runs, but uh, that was a pitching duel to me. I thought they pitched very well, both of them. And uh, it was, it was, I thought it was a really good game. I really enjoyed it. A lot of really good uh, pitching from those guys. Some good hitting, some timely hitting, um, and uh, a couple lasers. And from, uh, from Lou Bob and Max Stasi hit the ball 415. Cody Hoyer, who was already really good, uh, debuted a changeup. Um, I think he could be the setup guy. Uh, before long because bomber did give up some runs um otherwise i don't know shrug and say pretty good game didn't yeah, that game play but vaughn that game played the script i don't know why they didn't play vaughn they don't want to play him in left i guess lurie garcia you played, <laughs> zach, you played <laughs> zach collins you played zach collins over andrew vaughn in a He's game you were trying to win catcher tony la russa just what a dick i'm a deck no that 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 is a thing the white Sox fans should be extremely upset about what do you got all what are you, you doing? can hope for is vaughn comes in against a lefty rakes got collins goes over for a couple more days and tony the russa come like wakes up out of his coma sorry how about the <clears> game <throat> you were at uh, astros a's other than the uh, the jeers Oof, which laughing. were not in midseason form yet i thought bassett pitched okay uh but he's not he's not maybe gonna have a ton of length um and so the what you saw in Oakland when he came out of the game was that their their middle of their bullpen is not very good. Uh, Colorac came in and uh, you know gave up the gave up the goose. Is that a thing people saying? Gave up the goose. Uh, Who, who's goose I don't think that's an American expression. They may say it <laughs> other parts of the world. I thought Bassett looked all right, even though the 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 breaking ball is seventy two miles an hour. It got whiffs. Um, I thought he was okay. Uh, Petit was sitting 88. Uh, Calera gave it up. Uh, the guy Guduan couldn't find the. Uh, so that was the bad bullpen that we saw pretty much. Um, but uh, Granky, you know, 88, 89 miles an hour, uh, you know, carved him up. So I think you saw all of the flaws of the A's on display right away. Yeah. I think kind you of can a hit throw... or miss offense, mm -hmm. iffy bullpen. I think you can throw some middling starters at the A's pretty easily this year and feel fairly confident, especially in Oakland, that bad things really are not going to happen to you because it's just not its not a great lineup. It's very top-heavy, definitely some holes uh, in the bottom half especially. Uh, last game to get to, Giants-Mariners. Buster Posey had the hardest hit ball in that game. Uh, Kevin Gaussman was a guy that I missed out on for all of draft season. He pitched well. 
before things unraveled on the Giants' pen. Marco Gonzalez got knocked around a little bit in this one. Uh, what else stood out to you? A little bit weird. Uh, Montero doesn't really give up homers. He gave up a homer. Uh, I saw a bold predict, or not even a bold prediction, a prediction from uh, Brad Johnson that uh, Rafael Montero might be the first sort of established closer to lose his job. Um, I don't know. Do we know who? Like, it was a little bit of tie game is like an interesting thing because they might have been keeping their setup guy for after Montero. If mm-hmm you know, in, in a tie game, like, except it wasn't a tie game. They were going to win this game. So Will Vest <laughs> is the setup guy. Rule five guy, Will that, Vest. What are they doing? I think miss, 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 Misowich? Misowich. Misowich is, I, he's a lefty though, but I think I would say he came in after Montero. I would say that he is uh, next in line. That's my guess, but could be best. Um, and they could just let Montero do it ugly. Yeah, I don't think there's a rosterable fallback option in this pen yet. I'd be curious to see Kendall Graveman in short relief, though. I, I think there's a chance that maybe he he's throws actually 95, the next 96 guy. with a pretty good sinker when he when he's doing it. Yeah, he'd he'd um, be the guy that I would think about if I was in a deep enough league to stash the next Seattle reliever. Yeah, Fraley started and left, but got uh, in three walks. So uh, just after I drop him in my 20 team dynasty, I still don't think Fraley is a, a big of an asset. Hopefully, uh, Kyle Lewis's injury is short term. And as soon as Lewis is back, Trem- Tremel goes back to the left or Lewis takes over and left. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to overlearn from that Fraley and go try and get him. Um, Slater's Homer was like 99 miles an hour and oppo and I, I don't want to call it lucky. Uh, yeah. I don't think any homer is like 100% lucky, but I don't know that I saw that homer and was like, oh, Slater, go run and get him. I, I've seen somebody say like, oh, yeah, you can get Slater like 20 rounds later and get the same that you can get from Lou Bob. No, man, I don't I don't think that. I don't think wow, he's going to steal that many bases. Those are some strong drugs. Oh. <laughs> You're right. Oh. <laughs> That's I, incredible. I thought so as well. <laughs> I mean, like we're we are the fantasy proprietors of whatever we're going to call it—the eat this, not that of of player substitution. Right, exactly. <laughs> wow, um, that's pushing it a little bit. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's definitely pushing it. I think the cool thing here, though, Slater was leading off, like leading off against lefties uh, in daily moves leagues, especially. I think that's going to play up pretty nicely. I don't know how much he's going to play against same-handed pitching, so I think that really limits his appeal in weekly leagues, even though there is some power, there's some speed, and the shortened season uh, led to some pretty interesting numbers for Slater. We are going to go, because Ito has a chat that's about to start up, so cat gif. Getting uh, my cat gif right now. Coming momentarily. You can hit us up on Twitter. He is at Eno Saris. I'm at Derek Van Riper. If you don't already have a subscription to The Athletic, get in for $1 a month. You got through the weekend to get that at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. I'll get you all the columns, all the rankings, everything we do site-wide, $1 a month to start. You can email us, rates and barrels at theathletic.com is the best way to connect with us. For you know, Saris, I'm Derek and Riper. Don't give up the goose this weekend. Enjoy the first weekend of games. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs>